Hello, and welcome to this Integrated DNA Technologies webinar on in vivo RNAi considerations and examples. My name is Hans Packer, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. And the presentation itself will be conducted by two experts on in vivo RNAi applications, and it will be followed by those speakers taking questions from the audience. The first speaker will be Dr. Garrett Reddig, who is a research scientist in molecular genetics at Integrated DNA Technologies. Garrett has his PhD in pharmacy and medicinal chemistry from the University of Iowa, where he studied synthetic peptide delivery systems for plasma DNA and siRNA, both in vitro and in vivo. At IDT, Garrett has been involved in high-throughput screening of siRNAs in vitro, and he recently co-authored a comprehensive review on siRNA in vivo, which was published in Molecular Therapy. So Dr. Reddig will introduce some general considerations for in vivo RNAi experiments and some of our work here at IDT. And then his presentation will be followed by Pascal Petro, who is a senior PhD student in neuroscience in the laboratory of Dr. Philippe Serre at the University of Sherbrooke, which is in Quebec, Canada. Um, Pascal started his PhD in 2008 with a focus on the implication of neurotensin receptors in chronic neuropathic pain. His collaborations with IDT and our research team have on DSI RNA technologies has resulted in him also co-authoring two book chapters on the use of RNAi in vivo and various pain systems. So Pascal's presentation will be some examples of in vivo RNAi applications and research from his own lab on uh, acute and tonic pain conducted in the Surrey lab. So we'll follow that presentation with Garrett and Pascal addressing your questions about in vivo RNAi. And as attendees, you've been muted, but we encourage you to ask questions or make comments at any time during or after the presentation by typing them into the questions box, which you'll find in the GoToWebinar software. It's located at the right-hand side of your screen. You may have to click the little plus sign to open that up so you can type into it. And at the end of the presentation, during the question and answer portion, I will direct your questions to Garrett and Pascal. Also, in case you need to leave the webinar early or want to revisit it later for viewing, we are recording the webinar, and we will make this available on our website at www.idtdna.com and on our YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com forward slash idtdnabio. So now let me turn over this portion, this portion of the webinar to Garrett for his presentation on some of the general considerations for in vivo RNAi. And thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here to be able to provide a little background information and hit some of the highlights in terms of considerations that are in play when planning in vivo RNAi experiments. And then really, um, as a lead-in to Pascal's presentation um, for someone who is, is actually doing the work at the bench generating in vivo data with siRNAs and dicer substrate siRNAs. So first of all, obviously, uh, in vivo animal models are quite complex in, compared, in comparison to in vitro systems. And as a result of this, there are several considerations that need to be brought to the forefront in order to successfully transition um, what might be found to be potent siRNAs from in vitro tests into in vivo systems. And really, it should be remembered, too, that the research goals can really influence these considerations. Uh, for instance, you may be much more likely to choose a systemic route of delivery if your goal, as in the first bullet point, is defining a novel delivery system. Alternatively, you may be more interested in local delivery if your interest is um, having identified an oncogene that is overexpressed in a particular uh, cancer that a tumor growth that you can dose sRNA locally and observe a phenotypic response in the form of tumor regression or, or tumor cessation. So, as I was mentioning, there are several routes of delivery that are in play and that, that need to be considered and can, uh, can impact your results as you move to in vivo work. So, first of all, um, intravenous and intraperitoneal are systemic routes of delivery 
both are fairly conventional routes and relatively simple to carry out IV delivery by tail vein or IP delivery. Um, they have the advantage of achieving systemic delivery, of course, but on the other hand, they suffer from low bioavailability of the siRNA at the particular target tissue of interest. And specifically, IV delivery suffers from the high concentration of serum proteins that can bind these often anionic um, particles, uh, sRNA complexed with either lipid or polymer that's typically anionic in nature, bind preferen preferentially to serum proteins and can cause aggregation. On the other hand, IP delivery uh, doesn't face as many issues with and then better tolerates large particles dose, but it's more of a passive distribution as opposed to um, IV delivery, which is a more active distribution throughout the circulatory system. Oral delivery is something that we typically think of as systemic uh, in terms of small molecule dosing of pharmaceuticals. However, uh, for siRNA-related delivery, any example of, of oral delivery has been um, more it's been better classified as local delivery. They've been um, a couple of examples of acid labile um, delivery reagents that uh, deliver siRNA to uh, upon low pH to the uh, epithelial line of the, the gut or the small intestine. There are several options for local delivery, and these are just some examples that are listed here in the table below and in the picture above, typically you can expect higher bioavailability in terms of the dose on a mig per kg basis from a local delivery versus systemic delivery. However, there can be local barriers uh, for some of these delivery routes, specifically if you were trying to dose to lung tissue and uh, administering an intranasal dose, that you'd have to have some way for the siRNA or the complex siRNA to traverse through the uh, a mucus layer of the lungs or the respiratory system. And there may this may, in fact, be met with lower compliance as well as a higher degree, in some cases, of, of technical expertise required for some of these routes of delivery. This particular slide is, is a table that is borrowed from uh, the, the review that Hans mentioned that appeared earlier this year in molecular therapy. And what I wanted to point out is that the top part of the table, we're looking at intravenous delivery and intraperitoneal delivery. And these should say that the entire table represents in vivo publications using synthetic RNA, RNAi triggers really in the last five to six years. So what we see with systemic delivery, and of course, this is probably expected that you have to have some sort of lipid or polymeric or otherwise uh, conjugated, conjugated delivery system in order to protect the sRNA cargo upon IV or IP delivery. And so you can see most of the publications are segregated into or, or at least away from the naked delivery column. Whereas then when we turn to more local delivery, the, the complexation of sRNAs with a particular delivery system which which can, in fact, complicate the system a little bit. It does make it more complex because then not only are, are you met with having to choose an appropriate reagent to gain uptake into the cell, but then also there's the added level of complexity of unpackaging the siRNA from the delivery system. So if possible, um, in local delivery, where the siRNA would not be as exposed to nucleases when dosed directly into these tissue types, you see a much greater preponderance of, of naked delivery being used. So this is just really to highlight that the goal of your delivery, the route of delivery, can really dictate in many factors uh, concerning the delivery vehicle in use. And these factors play back and forth on each other and making decisions going uh, forward with these experiments. One thing certainly that needs to be uh, at least mentioned and addressed in terms of dealing with in vivo siRNA is immunogenicity 
And I've included this figure from Immunology and Cell Biology from 2007, a review article that appeared there that does a nice job of laying out the downstream pathways from the toll-like receptors, toll-like receptor 3 and toll-like receptors 7, 8, and 9 are endosomal receptors, which is significant because many of the siRNA uh, complexes would enter a cell by an endocytosis mechanism taken up into the endosome unpackaged, and then these toll-like receptors typically would, would be in place to identify single-stranded or double-stranded RNA that may represent um, the viral genetic material. However, it will also represent the single or double-stranded RNA that is the siRNA trigger that we're trying to introduce as well. And you can see that if recognized as a substrate by the toll-like receptors, which this would trigger downstream induction of interferon-inducible genes as well as inflammatory cytokines. Additional off-target effects, and I think something probably that we think of more specifically with the term off-target effects are passenger strand loading or sense strand loading into the risk complex or microRNA-like translational inhibition by loading in, of the seed region and finding complementary sequences to the seed region. Of course, the desired effect would be this on-target example of the guide strand or the innocent strand loaded into the risk complex, targeting the gene of interest X and achieving AGO2 mediated knockdown. Depending on the, the sequence characteristics and thermodynamics characteristics of the siRNA, it's possible that the passenger strand can be loaded into the risk complex and target a sense strand complement that might be present in some other gene, in this case denoted gene Y. It's also possible, and it's been recently um, found out, that it's not the core 19 sequence that is required for full, complementar full complementarity to mediate knockdown of a target messenger RNA. Rather, it's, it's sufficient to just have bases 2 through 8 at the 5 prime end of the innocent strand, so this heptamer uh, present the complement to this heptamer present in the 3 prime UTR, this would still bind and load into risk and would either mediate AGO2 cleavage or provide some sort of microRNA-like translational inhibition. So in order to circumvent some of these off-target effects, specifically um, that we've just talked about, immunogenicity and then sense strand loading as well as seed region um, mediated knockdown. There have been several different types of chemical modifications applied and brought into play in siRNA synthesis that can ameliorate some of these issues. So for example, 2 primal methyl modification is probably the most common chemical modification certainly that we use and, and that is in play in most of uh, the publications that you'll see. 2 primal methyl modification, modification first improves stability. It's been incorporated both into the sense and innocent strand. It can dramatically increase the half-life of an siRNA containing, for instance, every other base, a 2 primal methyl base, or some strategically patterned 2 primal methyl bases throughout the sense and or innocent strand uh, that can significantly improve the half-life of the siRNA duplex and serum, as well as maintain potency. And it's been also shown that it can be used rather sparingly in the siRNA duplex to make the particular duplex um, no longer as good of a substrate for the toll-like receptors. So it significantly decreases the, um, the downstream immunogenic response if incorporated into uh, an siRNA or a dicer substrate siRNA. 2 prime fluoro and 2 prime FANA modifications are quite similar and have both been shown to improve the stability. Uh, it's also been shown in a couple instances that the FANA can actually improve the potency as well as dramatically improve the stability of, of the siRNA. LNA, a locked nucleic acid, and UNA, both from the Wingle lab, um, 
the LNA is a definite stabilizing modification in terms of the thermodynamics. And for this reason, it really must be used sparingly uh, because of that TM boost. We can see an extended stability as well as maintaining potency and has also been shown to be incorporated into the seed region. Again, that's positions two through eight at the five prime end of the innocent strand to decrease um, seed region recognition in, in those microRNA-like effects in the three prime UTR of target genes. Likewise, UNA has been shown to be incorporated into the seed region, and, and the UNA is actually quite a destabilizing base, and particularly when incorporated at position seven of an siRNA in, uh, in the, within the seed region of the innocent strand has been shown to maintain potency and dramatically decrease uh, the seed region associated effects. This particular table uh, I just include to show the progression of the field of synthetic RNAi in vivo over the last decade plus since the discovery of RNA interference. You can see that there are 16 different clin clinical trials that have been opened or are currently open um, targeting about, I think it's, VEGF appears a couple times, so 15 different uh, potential genes of interest or disease states are addressed within this table. But it, up to this point, there have not been any that have been approved for uh, an FDA-approved drug to be brought to market. And then finally, uh, in this slide is sort of a segue to hand off to Pascal. This slide represents typically what we would do at IDT, depending on the level of collaboration with a potential collaborator who would want to do some in vivo work. We've had pretty great success with identifying potent siRNAs in vitro and tissue culture, um, and then have had some collaborations then uh, with others that have done the in vivo work. So in, in the first case, we would come up with a target, uh, a target of interest, and then that target validation would include defining, validating, designing qPCR assays, as well as include cell line selection that would have appreciable levels of gene of interest expression, as well as hopefully approximate the tissue target of interest uh, going forward in vivo. And then we would use uh, an IDT, a proprietary algorithm that uh, would define in silico the 10 most potent or expected most potent sequences against a given target. And we would assess the potency with lipid reagent and um, in vitro tissue culture transfection, typically looking at a dose response from 100 picomolar to 10 nanomolar. In this particular case, you can see that the gene that's being tested is PAC6, mouse PAC6. And you can see clearly that looking at the dose response curves, site 2049 and site 2206 are the most potent. So then we followed up with a subsequent experiment, which included resynthesis of now a 2 prime methyl modified antisense strand for 2049 and a 2 prime methyl modified antisense strand for 2206. And we retest those by the same protocol in vitro. And, and show in this case that we see retained potency and expected um, improved stability and decreased immunogenicity of the 2 primal methyl modified dicer substrate RNAs. Um, and one thing to mention then going forward to Pascal is that at IDT we do prefer the design of dicer substrate siRNAs, which is a 25 mer sense sequence and a 27 mer antisense sequence that enters the RNAi pathway a bit upstream of the risk complex it is first recognized by Dicer, diced down to the to a canonical 21-mer, and we've seen consistently either equipotency and and uh, predominantly greater potency of Dicer substrates entering the RNAi pathway at the Dicer level rather than uh, the canonical sRNAs entering at the risk level. So going forward. Then, and that wraps up my component of the presentation. This final slide is just to give you the references of the the reviews that I've mentioned, also some of the uh, 
references that pertain to the different chemical modifications that I mentioned on, on that particular slide. Um, and then with that, I will hand it back to Hans, who will set things up for Pascal. Okay, I want to thank Dr. Reddick for his informative presentation. And now I will turn this over to Pascal, who will describe some of the in vivo RNAi studies that uh, his lab, the lab of Dr. Saray, is working on in G protein coupled receptors and pain paradigms. So, Pascal? Yes, thank you, Hans, and thank you, Garrett, for your presentation. So, as was presented, I will uh, present some results obtained in our lab. Uh, since uh, collaboration from a couple of years between uh, Dr. Philip Sayas' lab in Sherbrooke and IDT research team in Iowa. So if we look uh, a little bit at what I um, get about the uh, exogenous mechanism, so there's two main pathways for uh, RNAi. So there's one endogenous pathway. This is a figure that we that I taken out from one of our book chapters that we published on <coughs> uh, SIR, the SIRNA. So the endogenous mechanism uh, involves microRNA, but I won't talk to this uh, today in, in the presentation. I will concentrate myself on exogenous mechanism, so either siRNA or dsRNA for disosubstrate siRNA. So as Garrett said, we use in our experiment the disosubstrate siRNA because its uh, literature so, show that it is more potent, and we can have the possibility to use a lower dose of siRNA. Uh, compared to classic siRNA with, with the use of dsiRNA. So if we look at the first step in this um, adventure is the in vitro validation. Like uh, Garrett said, once again, it's uh, done by IDT in our case. So we provide a target. We are working on neurotensin 2 receptor, which is a GPCR involved in pain. So we provide this target. Uh, IDT design the various sequences and candidate for this target. So then after that, we provide the, the custom cell line expressing uh, a DNTS2 receptor. And the uh, in vitro validation is made by IDT in their facility. Um, so transfection uh, into the cells uh, with RNA IAMAX uh, catching region in, in that case. So they tested the approximately 10 candidates from, in our case, 1 to 20 nanomolar of uh, DSA RNA. And as you can see here, the the two best sequences were uh, NTS2, so in the blue, uh, V11, and NTS2, V25, which were the most two potent ones. So after this selection is made, I send us the test silencers, and we're starting our testing in vivo. So just a little bit a look of our experimental design of what we did in our lab uh, with the in vivo uh, DSIRNA. So we inject two different times. So at zero hours, so this is our first uh, intrathecal injection of dsiRNA. And then 24 hours after, after this first injection, we inject a second dose of dsiRNA. And then 24 hours after the last injection, so 48 hours after the first injection, we started the behavioral testing. So we, started, we, we tested tail flick for acute pain uh, four days um, following the, the two intrathecal injection and for malin the, the first day after that. And we also tested the for mechanical allodynia through seven days after the injection. So if we look at the uh, first ratio that we use, because we use two different uh, types of uh, transfection region, so we use the IFECT region for the tail flake assay for acute pain, and in that case it is suggested a ratio of one for one to five uh, DSRNA complexes to uh, transfection region IFECT. And after the compensation is made, we wait about 5 to 15 minutes on ice before the injection is made within the next 15 minutes. And for the, the second test and the, the von free also, we use the, the transactin region, which is a protein-based protein region, uh, transfection region. And we use, in that case, a ratio of 1 to 15 of dsRNA to a transfection region. And in that case, we inject 5 micrograms of dsRNA compared to 1 microgram for the IFECT region. And in the case of transactin region, we had to wait uh, 30 to 40 minutes on ice before uh, the injection within the next 15 minutes. So as I said, I, we use this um, formulation, complex formulation for formalin test and uh, mechanical allodynia bonfrey. So if we look a little 
So we use uh, Sprague Dolly rats that we inject intrathecally. So as uh, Garrett said, uh, we use local administration of DSIRNAs directly into the central nervous system. So we inject, like you see here with the, with the blue arrow, uh, between the L5 and L6 vertebra. So directly in the coda kidney of the spinal cord. So like that we don't affect any motor impairment caused if we uh, touch the, the, the direct spinal cord. So like that we are sure that we, in the coda kidney, it's safe to, to not see any motor impairment caused by the, by the injection. So we inject from 5 to 25 microliter of DSIRNA complex with the, the transfection region. Um, so this volume is said to be the maximum of 10% of the cerebro cerebrospinal fluid, so the CEF CEF volume, uh, which is approximately 250 microliters on the 350 mic uh, gram rats. So we inject from 5 to 25, depending on how much DSRNA we want to inject, either one, five or more than that, and also depending on the transfection region that you use, either a lipocationic lipid or any protein-based region. So the first step to, to validate the use of those DSRNA in vivo was to, was to be sure that the DSRNA was reaching our uh, target tissue. So we inject, in that case, um, the Stremble DSRNA, so a negative control DSRNA coupled with a fluorescent dye. In that case, it was a Texas Red label uh, DSRNA directly in the spinal cord, as I presented to you just early. Um, and we harvested the DRG, DRG standing for dorsal root ganglia. As you can see here on the lower right, uh, the, the figure showing a cross-section of a spinal cord, and you can see the, the dorsal root ganglia standing or circle in red here. So in the DRG, you have all the cell bodies, all the neuron bodies, uh, the cell bodies of the neur neuron coming from the periphery uh, and reaching the, the central nervous system in the spinal cord and then through the brain. So when we uh, make some imaging on those uh, DRG, we see that we have a good penetration in all the neurons of the DRGs and you see some sort of punctuate uh, fluorescence. And when we look at the control without any transfection, it is known in the literature that the DRG neuron have a normal autofluorescence background. So if we look a little bit more in the spinal cord in that time, once again with the same uh, Texas label scramble, we can see that the uh, penetration, tissue penetration is still efficient in the spinal cord, as you can see with a specific neuron being marked by the fluorescent dye. And I'm showing you one, one images of uh, transfection with uh, the transaction region, since this is another transfection re region we had to, to validate the, the good penetration of this uh, uh, complexation too. And we have uh, the fluorescent is a little bit different than from a nice increase in fluorescence. So we have a good penetration in the tissue. So after the, the validation, in vitro validation, after the the to be being sure that the, the DSRNA reached our, our specific tissue, we wanted to validate if we were able to get a knockdown. So once again, with the same uh, injection protocol, we inject now the real DSRNA uh, targeted uh, against the NTS2 receptor, and we validate by qPCR the amount of uh, mRNA present in those tissue. And we can see that in the spinal cord and in the DRG, the two different DSRNA that we received from IDT, V2, V25 and V11, was able to then regulate the expression of neurotensin to receptor in those tissue. So continuing the step from in vitro validation, uh, tissue penetration, knockdown of a gene, then we, we were going to make the first behavioral uh, studies. So once again with the same protocol of injection, we inject the two, at two different times the, the DSRNA and we uh, evaluate the behavior by a tail flick. I don't have time to explain what is precisely this, this behavior test. I, will, I can explain it in the question part if you want. But just to know that we are looking at the latency response so, uh, of the rat. So the basal level here, represented by, 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 by this bar graph here, which is the effect only with a mismatch. So this is a control uh, DSRNA, a scramble DSRNA to assess of target effect. And you can see that so the, the basal level is approximately at three to four seconds. When we inject uh, the transfection region with the DSRNA only, we can see that the level is pretty much the same. 
And when we inject the GMP431, which is the specific agonist of NTS2 receptor, so known to induce analgesia, where we pass from approximately 4 seconds to 10 seconds, so we can induce an analgesia by this uh, compound injection. And when we inject the DSRNA uh, as the protocol as I present you, and then the GMP431, we can see we completely block this effect. So we block this at the GMP431 uh, because, of, because of the knockdown of the neurotensin 2 receptor. And the effect, the effect lasts for this DSRNA, so V11, for three days. So you can see the significant difference here. And at day four, we came back to, 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 to normal, so that the, the behavioral effect uh, was losing after four days uh, in that case. And if we look at the V25, the other uh, DSRNA targeted against MTS2 receptor, so we can see that we have pretty much the same behavioral response for the two first days. At day three, we have a tendency, but it's not significant. Enough. And at day four, we come back once again to normal. So these were results um, uh, taken from our first publication uh, with the use of DSRNA in, in 2008 in molecular therapy. But then I'm presenting you some results uh, in more a tonic pain model. So this is unpublished data, data but the, it's, a, it's on a written perspective. Uh, and I'm presenting you, so the formalin test, once again, I don't have time to explain all of the, the behavior tests, but just to know that we score the pain level of the animal uh, into, from 0 to 60 minutes, and you can see here the, the basal curve with only saline injection. And when we inject the GMP431, so the, the agonist of NTS receptor, we can modulate in what we call the inflammatory phase, so from about 20, 25 minutes to 60 minutes. We nearly completely block this, uh, the pain behavior observed on those animals. But when we inject the GMP431 after the DSRNA targeted against NTS2 receptor, so that case of V11, we can see that we completely block this effect induced by the GMP431. And if we look at the area under the curve of those, of those curves, um, we can see that the basal level uh, here, after the injection of GMP431 or the negative control, which is the, the scramble DSIRNA here to have validate for target, we can see that we don't have any, any diff significant difference. And when we inject the DSIRNA, either V11 or v, v, V25, we can see that we came back to, to, the, to the normal level so we completely block this effect of analgesia. Um, so once again, this is these two last two uh, results was a proof of concept study to validate that we were able to reach uh, a target in the central nervous system. But our, the next step was to uh, validate this approach in a, a way of thinking. So we use the chemokine receptor CCR2. Uh, so this is, which is a pronociceptive to target. The activation of this receptor induces pain. And in our case, we, in, we induce, uh, we activate this receptor by injecting, injecting intratically the MCP1, so monocyte chemotactin protein 1. Uh, and the injection uh, of this uh, chemokine uh, induces uh, neuroinflammation. So as you can see here, uh, once again, this is von Frey, I don't have time to explain, but we uh, take the withdrawal weight of the animals, so we have the baseline. When we inject MCP1, which is the, the red curve, we can see that we, we have uh, so the MCP1 injection at day zero, and then we follow the animals for seven days, and the, the neuroinflammation is uh, persistent in time. When we inject uh, negative control, so NC1 uh, scrambled DSRNA, there's no difference between uh, only MCB1 and MCB1 plus, plus and NC7. But when we inject the blue curve, the CCR2 uh, DSRNA targeted against the CCR2 receptor, we can see that we, we block this analgesia effect induced by the MCP1. And in that case, the effect was long lasting for seven days after the first injection. So uh, this is the last result that I'm pre presenting to you. So after the last, the, the last two results, that was a proof of concept. This one is more a uh, therapeutical uh, target, which is really interesting for... So a few conclusions about what I, what I presented to you today. So we sh I've shown you that DSRNA is a powerful tool to knock down a gene in the central nervous system. And this is also very interesting to, co to, to consider that 
instead of using knockout mice, we can use this technique to uh, knock down specifically in time a gene, and we don't have all the compensation of knockout mice that we that is reported in the literature. We were also able to achieve a potent CNS inhibition with a low dose of dsRNA, so either one or five microgram of dsRNA, depending on the transfection region that we use, and uh, showing that we have a good tissue penetration, either as well as in the DRG and in the spinal cord when conjugated to either transfection region, so uh, IFEC or transductin protein-based region. And we were also able to uh, inhibit the analgesia induced by the NTS2 agonists in a two model of, of pain, acute and tonic pain, and also to abolish the allodynia that was induced by uh, neuroinflammation after MCP1 injection in fratricoli, which is really a, um, so that's it for me. Okay, Pascal, um, thank you for your presentation. Thanks for sharing some of that data with us from the Surrey Lab. And uh, at this point, we will start answering some of the questions from the attendees. If you haven't already done so, you can enter the questions that you have into the questions box, which is part of the GoToWebinar software, and you'll find that on the right-hand side of your screen. And you may have to click the plus sign to access that. Um, there's a question here for Pascal, so I'm just going to start with that. Yeah. And you had to do in vivo and in vitro studies. You had to start off with some in vitro studies before you did the in vivo work. And this person wants to know how how well the in vitro stuff translates into the in vivo studies. Well, that's a good question. If we look back at the the first slide here that I that I present, uh, we can see here that uh, the level were pretty much the same. But in that case, V11. Uh, seems to be a little bit less potent than V25. But in our behavioral uh, results, it seems to be the opposite. So V11 seems to be the, a little bit more potent than V25. So it's a good translation from in vitro to in vivo because both DSRNA that were effective in in vitro worked in vivo, but it is in, in a different level. So I, I would say that there's a good transition, but you can you can't expect to be to be the same that what you see in vitro. Okay, so the next question that I have here is how long does the siRNA effect last? And maybe you can explain a little bit in terms of pain reduction. Okay. Yes, well, yeah. once again, if we go to the, uh, the results here, so in that case, uh, the, the effect lasts for let's say three days for for those uh, this type of test. So and after after, after the fourth day, uh, the behavioral response was coming back to normal. So is it because the uh, knockdown was wasn't present anymore, or it was only because the the, the system compensate for for this lack of of neurotensin receptor? Uh, it's hard to tell. Last one, in that case, the effect lasts for seven days, which is quite, quite interesting because only two injection of dsRNA, so at, at time minus two and minus one, uh, was able to uh, block the effect over a week. Uh, completely. So in, in that case, we think that we might have blocked uh, a precursor effect that primed the system, and with that, we were able to uh, reverse the, the allodynia induced by MCP1 injection. Okay. Um, here's a somewhat common question that we get: Is uh, how do you know that the effect that you're seeing is is based on you're knocking down the gene that you're trying to knock down, and it's not an off-target effect in in vivo? And I guess I'll let Garrett take that one first, since yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the type of experiment that. Uh, we would want to see, I guess, even if you were a reviewer putting yourself in a asking critical questions types of things, you would want to see some evidence of messenger RNA knockdown. So if it was a qPCR assay, or better yet, if it was a five prime race qPCR, that would show you a qPCR would show you the the relative levels of that particular gene of interest that were present. Five prime race would show you um, explicitly where. Uh, the cut site was, and, and you would know 
if your your siRNA was being uh, loading into risk and carrying out ago2 mediated cleavage of the specific site that you're targeting within that messenger RNA um, so I, I guess the general answer is the more assays that you can incorporate both functional or phenotypic also um, uh, genetic are the better in order to sort that out. And if I can add on, on this one, um, in, in our case we had two different candidates that we observed similar effects, so this is quite interesting. And also we have the indicative control, which is a, a scrambled DSRNA, so uh, if we would expect, expect that our uh, specific candidate would induce uh, off-target effect, we might think that our uh, scramble would induce also uh, off-target effects. So, uh, and we don't see any uh, side effects or things like that with the negative control. And our two candidates are giving the same uh, the same behavioral response. And we also, and since we did the um, the qPCR to validate the downregulation of a neurotensin two receptor with our two candidates, and that we were able to reverse the effect induced by GMP four fifty one. So. Taking this all together, we are confident that what we saw behaviorally was mainly due to uh, the observe the, the effect the effect on neurotensin two receptor and not enough target effect. So still kind of on the same subject. Do you check to see if the siRNA or dsiRNA shows up in other organs or tissues in the body? How do you um, deal with the fact that you know that gene might be expressed elsewhere? Well, it is known that uh, neurotensin receptor is expressed uh, nearly throughout all the body in the gut, for example. But since we inject intrathecally, we specifically uh, reach a region of the body that is uh, restricted uh, to the central nervous system. So we don't go into the uh, supraspinal level, so in the brain, that can lead to side effects if we modulate this receptor there and we don't also touch to the receptor uh, which is expressed in the gut. So taking that into consideration, we focused on what we see uh, so intrathecally in the spinal cord, so more locally. So we expect that we, we don't see any side effect going from um, downregulating this receptor elsewhere in the body. Okay, um, Pascal, this one is specifically for you. Why did you choose um, different transfection agents to perform the different pain behaviors, to test the different pain behaviors? Uh, you had IFECT and transductin, and then the tests were the tail flick versus the formalin test? Yeah, that's a good question, because when we started the, the experiment, we did everything with IFECT, and it was, it was working well for the acute pain, so the tail flick test. But when, when going to uh, the tonic pain test, when so formalin, uh, the injection of transfection region alone, I think, was inducing some kind of analgesia, so which was quite a problem. So we screened a couple of other regions uh, commercially available uh, on the market, other other cationic lipid, uh, all sort of, of those things. And finally, we when we tested the uh, uh, peptid-based region transuctin, it was the only one who did not induce by itself uh, side effects in the test that we, are, that we were using. So we decided to go with this one since it was uh, inert in our, in, in our test. So I guess that uh, my advice would be to, uh, every time you start a, a behavioral testing, you need to validate first the transfection region alone to be sure that there is no side effect induced by the transfection itself. Okay. Um, let's see here. Here's a good question. So this question is, how does the target protein half-life affect the dose of the siRNA or dsiRNA required in order to see an effect of the mRNA versus protein? Garrett, maybe you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, one thing that we know is that we can see uh, an mRNA effect knockdown effect after 24 hours certainly and in less than that 12 18 or 12 or 18 hours um, we can follow with seeing usually maximal protein knockdown 
at about 72 hours, of course, that's going to be dependent upon what the half-life is of that protein. So I guess if it's going to be, if, if the protein would have a longer half-life, um, you would want to have more risk-loaded complex for a longer duration um, in order to in order to have the messenger RNA degraded that that's you know sitting there waiting longer for that uh, protein to cycle away and, and trigger the, the need for more I guess um, as far as a specific you know a half-life of X equates to a dose or multiple doses of Y micrograms of sRNA, I, I don't have that. But certainly that's a factor that needs to be titrated back and forth. And I think if you do some time course experiments, you can find the optimal window of, OK, this is the dose of sRNA required to knock down or observe maximal knockdown of this long half-life protein out at eight days or something like that. Okay, I think that's something that's best answered empirically, I guess. <laughs> Sure. So, do you, do you usually see a relationship between the dose of the the RNAi method that you've chosen and the uh, the duration of the effect? Is there usually a relationship between those? Well, I th I think the effect would be um, depending on, on which type of of sRNA you use. Uh, since the first uh, publication on with sRNA, we're using what we can call classical. 21 mer sRNA, and in that case, you need to you need to inject approximately 100 micrograms to have a potent effect. So in that case, uh, you add a lot of of off-target effect and side effects. So with using in our case the sRNA, uh, you can manage to use only one or, for example, five micrograms of of the sRNA. So in in that in that case, the effect lasts approximately four or or seven days, and uh, I guess that. Uh, injecting a higher concentration of dsRNA could maybe lead to a longer uh, sustained effect, but in that case you might have the risk to to have any uh, off target or, or side effects and I wouldn't consider adding that that much more because you might have the, the side effects the risk of side effects might be bigger than the possibility to increase the the lasting of the effect behaviorally. Yeah, that's definitely a, a point I agree with um, with Pascal is that it would be a tough sacrifice to jack up the concentration, so to speak, uh, the, increase the dose significantly in order to try to achieve a longer duration of effect. And as long as we're on the subject, I'll actually throw in one more question that's uh, related. So does the length of the effect depend on the method of delivery um, and in what way? Well, like like Garrett said, you have either systemically uh, delivery routes or locally, and I think that if you can manage, in our, in our case, we did only two injection of dsRNA, but I, I guess that we could make uh, several more uh, injection, and, and those injection wouldn't affect uh, that much the 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 wellness of the animal, but maybe you can achieve a more sustained knockdown by several injection, or you can systemically and maybe you can have better long lasting but the, 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 the systemic route could be more challenging for some reason. Okay. Um, looking at the, somebody's asking about the immune response that you sometimes see in vivo and they want to know if there are any common structural modifications or chemical modifications on siRNAs that result in unwanted immune responses. Garrett? Yeah, there are two primal methyl modifications that can be made. I can't tell you specifically what they are off the top of my head, but um, some of the references that I included would have those, and, and certainly some of the reviews would, would point directly to some of the earlier work that's been done uh, to really reduce those immune responses uh, to siRNAs. Typically, okay. again, we use the two primal methyl modification. Okay, and uh, on a related subject again, so what's the best way? Are there, are there any good assays to assess the immunogenicity of, you know, and off-target effects for in vivo? 
There are. Um, one thing that is included in the molecular therapy review that, that we put out um, earlier this year is a supplemental table that includes, so the table that I showed within the presentation was just one that was um, showing which particular in vivo studies utilize which delivery route and what general disease state they were targeting. The more detailed table in the supplemental information also lists all of the um, uh, particular immune response assays or cytokine assays that were in play. So anything from ELISA of, of particular interleukins or cytokines um, to hematological parameters that I looked at, uh, white cell, T cell counts, things like that are, are have all been used and are all commonly used. And, you can find, if you go to the molecular therapy supplemental information, I think a nice uh, <clears throat> collection of really all of the all those types of assays that have been used by uh, by different researchers over the last five to six years in this area. Okay, uh, let's see here. Here's a specific one for Pascal for his research. Uh, most transduction methods are very inefficient. And this person is just wondering if you had any idea why the delivery to the dorsal root ganglions worked so well in your model. Well, that, that's a good question. And I don't know if I, if I can answer correctly, because uh, we were just all so happy to, to see that. So we, uh, we inject the with following our, our, our protocol. And, and maybe based on, on IDT suggests us of a ratio and everything with the transfection region. And when we first uh, harvested the RG, uh, and we were also pretty surprised of seeing that much one integration. And what's interesting is that the, the integration was um, pretty much similar as in, in all types of, of neurons. So either small, medium, or large neuron, or a glial cell. So I wouldn't say, I think I can say why we have that much a good uh, penetration, but I think that following really, really well the protocol that were suggested by, by the company, we were able to achieve that, that much uh, tissue penetration. Okay, and uh, one more. This is very specific, Pascal. The, this person is just wondering what the, uh, the turnover is for the receptors that you're interested in how, for the protein at the protein level. Well, the the neurotensin receptor is known to to internalize, so and and kept uh, in some into some vesicle. So depending on uh, if the this vesicle will be targeted to to be degraded or stay there to be readdressed re to the membrane, uh, it depends on on type of stimulation. So either you're looking into chronic pain or to acute pain, the the, the result might be quite different. And uh, I think that down regulating the mRNA uh, and our, our results tend to show that the the effect we, we can conclude if the effect is based on uh, the novo production of neurotensin receptor or or maybe some kind of trapping of those receptors uh, inside the physical but I mean the, the behavior um, results show that the effect is is lasting at least for a couple of days and but I, I can't say uh, how long the the protein level will be downregulated or upregulated after how many days. Okay. Uh, and here's one more general question, um, Garrett. I will let you answer this one. And it's if you have a in vitro siRNA effect that you can measure by um, qPCR and two different siRNAs work, but then when you get to in vivo and only one of those siRNAs works in vivo, is there something that you can think of that would account for that generally? Uh, yeah, certainly, well, I don't think there's any general rule for that. I, I guess I could hand wave some things, like maybe the sequence dependency of one of them makes it more susceptible to some additional nucleases that might be present in vivo. Also. There are, with using a qPCR assay, we have seen that um, perhaps 
if if one of the siRNAs is effective for maybe that's closer to the particular qPCR assay that's being used uh, that's that's in play and maybe the one that doesn't work is further away and this would be then um, one of the classic symptoms of of qPCR uh, one of the negatives can be this artifact of retained fragments now if the retained fragments aren't uh, aren't present in vitro then you wouldn't expect that that would be this that artifact would creep in moving in vivo but at the same time if you're if you're not working in exactly the same cell type so for instance if you were in HeLa cells in vivo and then you transitioned to some other tissue or sorry HeLa cells in vitro and transitioned to some other tissue in vitro there may be some nucleases that uh, that would chew back after the AGO2 cleavage in the in vitro assay and wouldn't have any retained fragments and perhaps those nucleases aren't present in the particular tissue type in vivo. Um, that's a long way to say that I don't have a specific answer, but you can think of a couple things that might be in play there. Okay, and I suppose that's something, um, if this person wanted to follow up with you by email or something, that would be okay? Sure. Um, and then I just kind of just bring something up here with uh, Pascal, but maybe this is something for the both of you, because this is kind of talking about the difference of in vitro versus in vivo, which was there was some mention from somebody else in Pascal's lab earlier that you see something very different for transfecting cells, uh, neurons in vitro versus in vivo. And I'm just kind of wondering if you could describe that a little bit and if it's like a surprising thing or if it's common yeah, well, that, that happens. Yeah, I can add on, on this. It, it's, it was pretty interesting also when we saw the, the first results on, on uh, imaging after the transfection with the siRNA coupled with the Texastrad region because uh, it is known that, at least for in vitro experiment, uh, neurons are, first of all, hard to, to culture and then really hard to transfect uh, since because this is cell that does not um, grow very well in culture. So our first results show that we were able to, uh, to infiltrate the neuron uh, in vitro. So it might be really a, a profound uh, in, uh, experiment because it shows that we can uh, avoid going in vitro to validate this because in vivo is working even better than what we see in vitro. So that was, yeah, quite surprising to see that much uh, integration of DSRNA in, inside the, the neuron. Is that something that you guys think is common? Like sometimes, you know, just like a cell type will work better in vivo than in vitro or vice versa? And that's either of you. Yeah, well, I think for, for some type of cells that are, are maybe sometimes hard to culture or hard to transfect or hard to reach, um, the, the, the in vivo might be better since it's, it's in physiologic uh, environment, might be more uh, complete to integrate various siRNA or anything like that uh, compared to what we can see in vitro. And maybe uh, Garrett can add something on, on different type of cells. Yeah, well, one thing that I would just say from my graduate work is, like Pascal is saying, that we ended up looking at different delivery systems going uh, directly in vivo because several of the parameters that we were trying to introduce weren't well represented in an in vitro system and so we needed to um, dose these nanoparticles containing both in our case plasma DNA and siRNA in vivo in, in order to get uh, the most re reliable results. We didn't, I guess the point is that we didn't necessarily find a direct correlation between the most potent delivery system we were using in vitro um, than compared to the most potent and effective delivery system that we saw when we transitioned to using a mouse model. So we went to exclusively using the mouse model to assess this. Okay, and uh, we're getting pretty close to our time here, but um, one more quick question just following up on that. Um, can you just say a little bit about are there instances where one delivery agent works better in vivo compared to in vitro? And if you have like any specific examples. Garrett, do you have anything? Yeah, I don't. I don't have any specific examples necessarily. We haven't 
necessarily in our hands done any in vivo work. We've we've done a fair amount of in vitro screening, but so my experience is a little bit limited with um, transitioning and using specific uh, in vivo reagents and and being able to say how they match up with in vitro results. It seems like there would be differences just because, you know, context dependent, you know, you have all the support cells and all the rest of the tissue and stuff, the rest of the organism, so it seems like yeah, there are differences. Of course, sure there the same are. things uh, that would apply that I, you know, talked about with my previous work would, would be in play in that if you're looking at the delivery system, like you say, Hans, the, the context of it is totally different when you move into an in vivo system. Okay, and that seems to be all the questions we have, which is great because we're about out of time here. So I just want to thank Garrett and Pascal for their excellent presentations today and for answering questions for us. And I want to thank everyone else for attending today's presentation and let you know that this is one of a series of presentations on RNAi that we will be conducting as well as other topics in molecular biology. Um, we'll email you about these future webinars as we schedule them. and. The recording for today's presentation will be available on our website in the next few days. You should also receive a follow-up email about that, and that will be at www.idtdna.com, and also on our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash idtdnabio. Um, thank you again for your participation today, and we wish you the best of success in your research.